All right, so part two. Uh, we left off with the Crusades here. So what winds up happening is that Emperor Alexius Comnenus reaches out to Pope Urban II and, of course, Robert of Flanders. Uh, and he basically is going to entice primarily the Franks to come on over to Rome for a meeting. Uh, really, they, they I should say they don't actually go to Rome. They go to uh, Cluny in France. Uh, and they are going to meet Pope Urban II. And he is going to engage the nobles of France, the Franks, to a holy war. He wants them to engage in a crusade. Uh, so he calls for this sort of gathering of knights to retake the Holy Land. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, so over the next 300 years, we're going to see a number of these crusades that are being launched. Uh, we're going to reclaim uh, these sort of territories for Christendom. Uh, and the Franks, as we've learned from Charlemagne on, uh, they are really good at spreading the faith by the blade, right? Uh, so now uh, we're going to take some of these guys, and we're going to redirect their violent energy elsewhere, okay? And we're going to do this uh, in the name of Christendom. So the Crusades has a few goals, all right? One well, of the biggest of which we've talked about in another session was that we want to sort of unite uh, with the Byzantine Empire, uh, sort of heal the rift between the Western Catholic Church and the Eastern Christian Orthodox Church, the Holy Roman Empire, with the Byzantine Empire. Uh, we want to stop the Muslim attacks against Christians. Uh, and we want to reclaim Palestine, right? To reunite all of Christendom, right? So we want to repair the split between Eastern and Western uh, empires. Uh, and that's something that they want to do uh, because they've been split up since 1054. So... In addition to the kings, the church uh, both saw the Crusades as an opportunity to get rid of what we call the quarrelsome knights, okay? So not all knights are really good, upstanding Christians. Uh, they're warriors by nature, and that makes them violent. Uh, and sometimes when they don't have a war, uh, they turn their violent energies inwards into their own lands, into their own society. So they might pick on the villagers and the peasants that they may actually be sworn to protect. They may rob them uh, and cause them havoc and harass them. So uh, this is a great way for the church and kings to sort of get these violent guys out of here and put them somewhere else and use their violent energy uh, for what they would consider a good cause. And this causes the crusade. So, hey, you guys want loot? Uh, well, if you go on these crusades, instead of robbing the peasants you're sworn to protect, you can go over to the crusades, to the Holy Land, and reclaim some relics for the church, and maybe a little bit for yourself as well. And, as an added bonus, uh, killing is a sin, right? So what per Pope Urban II does, is he says that there will be a complete, a complete remission uh, of sin, he calls uh, anything that is a sinful act like killing done in the service of the church will be automatically forgiven. And if you go on this crusade, this holy quest, uh, that's a straight shot to heaven. So as a symbol, they will sign and sew the red cross onto the tunics, what we call the tabards, uh, the front part of their armor, their chainmail here, uh, and this is a sign that they have taken this vow to go on this quest, and that by going on this quest, they get a guaranteed spot in heaven. Uh, and remember, this is the Pope. This is the Word of God. They fully believe this, these crusaders. So this alone is a perfect enticement to get them to go on the crusade. So who would go on this crusade beside these really violent knights uh, that don't have a whole lot to do? Uh, but pick on the peasants in their own countryside uh, and quarrel with other uh, nobles. So you have younger sons of nobles, right? Eldest sons inherit the property of the father. So this is a great way for a younger son to find position in society by going on this adventure. Uh, merchants, 
would go along. Hey, these knights are going to need food. They're going to need uh, weapons. They're going to need their armor repaired, boots taken care of, horses looked after. Uh, there's a lot that goes on, so there's money to be made here. And you'll find that a lot of merchants from predominant Italian cities, uh, as I mentioned last session, Dondolo of Venice uh, in the Fourth Crusade, uh, he had the Crusaders owed him tremendous loans because he owned all the ships in the dockyards. Uh, and we're going to get to that again in a moment. Uh, so this is a great way to also win back control of key trade routes in India, Southeast Asia, and China from Muslim traders. So this is a great enterprise if you're a merchant. Uh, you can really sort of dictate and control the violent energies of these knights. Uh, so that leads us to the first and the second crusade, right? So the knights have this saying in Latin, Deus Volt. In English, it translates to God wills it. Uh, this is their call to arms, right? So they sew the red crosses into their tunics. Uh, they scream, God wills it. Uh, and they go to battle with a religious zeal, okay? So they answer this call to reclaim the Holy Land. So by early 1097, there are three armies of knights. I have mentioned this before in class. Most of the Crusaders are the French or the Franks, but you do have, from the Holy Roman Empire, Bohemians, of course, Germans, Englishmen, Scots, Italians, some Spaniards, uh, and altogether, they are incredibly ill-prepared for this journey. Uh, they don't know the geography. They're unprepared for the heat of the climate of the desert during the day and the cold of the desert at night. Uh, they don't understand the culture fully. Uh, they don't understand the tactics that the Seljuk Turks use, namely using bows and arrows from horseback and not engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, but altogether, even despite the fact they have no grand strategy to reclaim Jerusalem itself, they are going to march the desert, be attacked and harassed, uh, and with less than one-fourth of the original army, because most of them die not just because of the engagements in battle, but disease, like dysentery, lack of water, food, heat, exhaustion, illness. Uh, they are somehow miraculously going to besiege Jerusalem for over a month, and they're going to capture the city on July 15th, 1099. This is a really important date, because this sets up the Crusader states, which you can see from their routes, right, all the way through Western Europe, uh, and you can kind of see Right here, these crusader states are going to be set up. The big ones, Antioch, Edessa, Akar, and of course, Jerusalem. So, the crusaders managed to reclaim these holy lands. But it's not a whole lot. You know, it's a small strip of land. Uh, but it's very important, uh, religiously speaking. So, it only stretches 650 miles from Edessa uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, and like I said, there's only four of these feudal crusader states uh, in this territory, each ruled by a European noble. Well, they're vulnerable because they're not well secured. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of support from back home. Uh, and eventually there's going to be a Muslim counterattack in 1144 and Edessa will be reconquered by the Turks. So this kind of leads to a second crusade, which is organized to recapture the city. Ultimately, though, uh, according to an historian of the time by the name of Odo of Duwil, uh, the Byzantines betray the Western Christian Crusaders. Uh, they find that they don't culturally meet uh, these Western Christians. They speak Latin. The Eastern Christians speak Greek. Uh, they can't seem to agree on things. And plus, they did agree to return these cities like Jerusalem, Antioch, Akar, Edessa, to Emperor Alexius Comnenus after the crusade was over, and they never did that. So they find that, you know what, we actually get better deals with the Muslim Turks. So they kind of sell them out. They have some scouts lead them to an ambush, and the second crusade is an absolute disaster. Uh, so the armies are going to struggle, and they're going to straggle home in defeat. And then in 1187, we talked about this again, Jerusalem will be reclaimed by a Kurdish warrior, uh, the Muslim leader Saladin. And this starts the Third Crusade. Uh, so the Third Crusade's ultimate goal, recapture Jerusalem. We got three of Europe's most powerful monarchs involved. Philip II of France, 
and the German Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa, who we learned about in a prior session, uh, and then the English King Richard the Lionhearted, all right, Richard III. We've also talked about him as well. Well, much like the First Crusade, they're disorganized. Philip and Richard argue over who should be the real leader. Philip uh, finds that a lot of his guys want to follow Richard III, so he gets upset, packs up his toys, and he goes home. Barbarossa, after he lost at the Battle of Leilano against the Pope and the Italian merchants to, you know, foot soldiers with crossbows, this is his attempt to redeem himself. So 14 years later, you know, from 1176 to 1190, he goes on this journey, uh, but we already learned in 1190 he is going to drown. He's going to fall off his ship uh, during the journey and drown. So this leaves Richard as the de facto leader. Uh, he and Saladin are going to meet in battle multiple times. By the time Richard takes command of the Crusaders, he's starting to win back territories and battles. Uh, but he finds out that his brother, John, is trying to seize the throne back home. And that is going to prompt Richard the, the, the Lionhearted to sort of pursue a peace treaty with Saladin in 1192. You get to keep Jerusalem, but you also have to ensure safe travel for Jewish and Christian merchants uh, and pilgrims. Uh, they can enter and visit the city's holy places freely. And that pretty much ends the Third Crusade. After that, the Crusades are pretty much disasters after that. There's going to be future Crusades. Uh, the Fourth Crusade is such a disaster that um, the Crusaders never make their way to the Holy Land. There's no, they, they don't even come close. Uh, because they owe Dondolo of Venice a huge uh, fee for building all the ships and for supplying them their food, they're going to stop over in Constantinople to try to get some money. Uh, but what ends up happening is they wind up sieging the city and they are going to ransack Hagia Sophia and steal, steal a lot of holy artifacts and money uh, to repay the debt. So absolute disaster. Uh, and then afterwards, two later crusades, they don't come to the Holy Land. They go to Egypt instead as a means to weaken Muslim forces before going to the Holy Land. But they don't really conquer much land or any territory. And here's how bad the Crusades get. You have the Children's Crusade, uh, which comes in two phases, in 212, two different movements. The first, led by a 12-year-old boy by the name of Stephen O'Cloy. Uh, 30,000 children follow him, all under the age of 18. And they're armed only with their belief. I'm sure that'll help them with seasoned veteran Seljuk Turkish warriors. Uh, JK. Most of them will be captured, killed, they'll die of cold and starvation, uh, and a lot of them are just basically stolen and sold into slavery. Uh, a huge enterprise for the Turks. Uh, and then in Germany, Nicholas of Cologne gathers 20,000 children. They're going to march to Rome. They have to cross those treacherous Alps to get to Italy. Well, they freeze and they die. Uh, about 2,000 survive the trip. Uh, the return trip to Germany. So uh, 18,000 people die on this crusade, uh, and then only a few board ships for the Holy Land, and they're never heard from again. But you do have one successful crusade uh, in the aftermath here, and it's a long crusade. Uh, it's known as the Reconquista. This is the attempt by the Catholic Church to expel the Muslim Moors, right, from Spain. Uh, so the Christians only have the tiny kingdom of Granada, and then soon the tables flip. It will be the Muslims who only control the tiny kingdom of Granada as the Christians reclaim everything. And by 1492, Granada finally fell to the Christian army of King Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, the Spanish monarchs. This leads to the Inquisition. All right, Ferdinand and Isabella, they want to expel Jews and Muslims from Spain, uh, they're going to force people to convert to Christianity. Uh, so if you are not a Christian, you're a heretic. And you are liable to be tortured. Uh, and then maybe even burned at the stake. So all of this leads to basically a new Christian reconquering of Western Europe. Well, that'll do it for us. Uh, 
Take it easy, folks.